All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the big program. I'm Matt Yancic. Uh, I am the founder and head game master here at Manufactured Myth and Ledger Domain, and this is Role Player with a Thousand Faces. And uh, I'm pretty excited tonight because you may have noticed my guest is Brian McClellan, uh, author of quite a very uh, a, a, a few very good. Uh, fantasy novels, uh, the Powder Mage trilogy, which is what got me into uh, Brian's books. Um, and so for those of you perhaps who haven't read the Powder Mage trilogy, you can picture the French Revolution crossed with the Industrial Revolution, crossed with flintlock pistols with traditional magic and set it in a fantasy version of France. And uh, you have a good idea of, of what Brian has created. Um, and as a bonus, because other programs just give you, you know, f fancy famous authors, he's also converted his system into a role-playing game that is available uh, uh, for the Savage World system, which is one of my personal favorites as well. Um, so uh, he's also the, also he has released a duology, which I, I'm assuming may continue to go on, or it may just be a duology. We'll find out in just a moment by saying hello to Brian. Brian, hello. Thank you so much for coming on the program tonight. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Uh, thanks. Thanks for coming. It is it is you, sir. It is you that is reaching <laughs> down to me uh, on on to the program. Um, so can. Can you tell us a, a, a little bit about who you are? I mean, I know who you are, and I know what you do, and I'm a big fan. But but why don't you take a moment as as a teacher? I like I like it when I see people you know claiming um, the great things that they've done. Tell us about all the cool stuff you've done. So um, I write epic fantasy novels. Um, I have been going since 2013 uh, as a full time author. Uh, and uh, my first book, uh, actually right over my shoulder here, uh, Promise of Blood, um, came out in 2013. And uh, I ended up with, um, gosh, six books in the Powder Mage series, yeah. um, as well as a bunch of novellas, short fiction. Um, and uh, gosh, so so I did Powder Mage for, that was kind of what launched my career mm. um, and is pretty much what I'm known for at this moment. Yeah. Um, I... Uh, and uh, and I've uh, I've also done some urban fantasy, the Valkyrie Collection series, which is actually over my left shoulder here. Um, and uh, and that's uh, some uh, so so we've got uh, kind of a, a little bit of a you know jump back and forth there between genres. But basically, I'm an author. Um, I write uh, fantasy novels for a living, and uh, and it's pretty great. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, I'm jealous. I'm very <laughs> jealous. I, I think it's awesome. As as an English teacher, I think every English teacher has a, a little uh, breakout author inside of them that wants to just, you know, get it all out. Um, but uh, I want to just say personally, and I want to tell, uh, let everyone know at home, the guests that I choose for my program, I, I he's not paying me. Um, they come from the stuff that I have sitting on my shelves and that I enjoy reading. And as an English teacher, um, I have to admit, the cover of your of your first book was what caught my attention. But of course, the cover is only what you know catches your attention. And, but your <laughs> your style and the story are what really keeps you coming back for for more. And and I greatly I greatly uh, enjoyed your Powder Mage books. Um, but speaking of stuff that you get hooked on. Um, tell me what started your love for reading and, and writing? Can we rewind all the way back to little Brian when he was running around and maybe picking up his first book or writing his first oh, story? Yeah, that's a long time ago. Um, I, uh, so not as mom, long as mine. <laughs> when I was a kid, my mom, uh, volunteered at the local library and, uh, and it was every Wednesday night she would go and uh, she was in the genealogy library, like a little back room in the corner that she would help, you know, kind of the old people in the area do their genealogy mm -hmm. before the days of ancestry.com and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, and I pretty much always went with her uh, and I would, it was probably four to five hours uh, and I would just go and I would just roam the stacks all night. 
I would, you know, pick up you know, books. I'd, I'd always start with like the comic books. I'd, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, not like uh, it was like, is, what's the different, like, what's the term difference between like Garfield and, you know, like the X-Men? Um, so, so my, so I would get like Garfield and stuff, you know, the kid comic books, Calvin and Hobbes, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and, you know, eventually you run out of those. Right. Uh, and so I'd start reading, you know, random stuff. I'd go looking for things and, uh, and I, I ended up reading a lot and, uh, we would, uh, my mom, because she was volunteer, she, she didn't have the restriction on the number of things you could take home with you. Everywhere. Wow. She's a and, renegade librarian. And so we, uh, so I would take home an enormous stack mm -hmm. and it would literally be everything from Winnie the Pooh VHSs to, you know, uh, uh, Encyclopedia Brown and, you know, all the, like anything, like just anything I could find um, that seemed fun and kind of, so that's probably what kickstarted me really being into reading. Um, and, uh, and it really never stopped. Uh, I mean, well, as at least as a young kind of uh, as a teenager, um, I just I just read voraciously. Um, anything I could get my hands on, I would order things from the interlibrary loan system. Cool. And just get big piles of stuff. Yeah. I remember uh, I, I hit sixth grade, uh, and there was a context a contest. This was like right. I don't even remember if I don't even know if the accelerated reader program still exists. Mm -hmm. um, but this was like right north towards the beginning of the accelerated reader program. And you would read a book, you would take a test on the computer in the library. And depending on the test, you'd get points for that book. Oh yeah. And, uh, and I remember I hit sixth grade and, and everybody in my class, it was a re relatively small class. I think it was mm -hmm. only 180 people or so. Um, everybody knew that I read a lot. And I remember a couple of kids coming up to me and saying that they were going to, they were going to win that contest because right. it was like a hundred dollar savings bond you'd earn. Right. Uh, whoever got the most points. And I, I think I won by like four times the next kid. Um, like it was just, you know, I was 12 and I was taking the tests for, you know, Les Mis and Count of Monte Cristo and, uh, and everything King Arthur, including like the really obscure things that are written in English you can't really read. Right. Um, I just everything. I would read so much. So let me ask you, um, do you think that that's something that just sort of, so which, like it's a chicken and the egg situation. Do you think you picked up something, I don't know, low level or whatever it was as a, as a very, very small child and then just sort of got into it? Or do you think it was a case of, just maybe the opposite there and it was just that you read so much that it actually you know impressed you with this this love or yeah, i guess it's I both mean, really right yeah it is it is both you know i did i started with the little stuff i started with garfield comics which is mm -hmm. you know that's the it's the dane cook of comic books um yes it's uh <laughs> yes and, it is <laughs> and you know like but then i like work out very quickly from there um and and i just ended up just loved reading and it's funny because that the that whole thing with the accelerated reader program it was mm -hmm. the first time because they offered this this uh savings bond and it was the first time i remember thinking to myself oh hey i love reading and they're gonna give me money right. if i read the best right <laughs> and like that just right. like clicked you know it was it was great and so I, uh, so I started, you know, just getting really into it and I just read a ton, you know, in sixth grade, obviously, but I never stopped reading. I, I think, I don't think I really hit epic fantasy probably until maybe eighth grade or ninth grade. Mm -hmm. Um, I was reading a ton of other stuff up until then. Um, but like, but I remember when I was really, when I was probably about that age, uh, somebody gave me a David Ennings book cause they knew I liked mm -hmm. to read. Mm-hmm. And I, I actually just, I never even read it. I just set it on my shelf. And then I probably reached around eighth or ninth grade. And I saw that on my shelf and I pulled it down and I, I read it and I loved it. I thought this was really cool. And so I started looking actively for more epic fantasy. Right. And then, uh, and, and I just, I, I read everything of David Eddings. I read, uh, gosh, the, um, I think one of the other first ones for me was, um, oh gosh, I just forgot the name of it um it's the, the green angel tower is like the third one mm -hmm. um 
yeah, I, I'm, I'm forgetting the author and the, the first book. Um, but uh, absolutely. So I just started reading these big fat tomes. Right. And obviously I had already read, you know, The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings and C.S. Lewis and all that stuff back in my like, you know, kind of early days. Um, you know, in fact, my mom read me uh, C.S. Lewis when I was just little and I couldn't even read yet. Oh, She'd wow. read it to you before bed. Um, so I'd already read all that, but like in terms of like the 80s and 90s, like the big, thick epic fantasy tomes, yeah. that's yeah. when I started getting into those. Um, and then uh, and then probably around college was I started m like meeting other people that like to read epic fantasy um, and people started recommending me modern authors as opposed to, you know, like like the old guys. Um, so right. I, then I started reading like Joe Abercrombie and Steven Erickson and uh and then i ended up in a class uh taking a class from brandon sanderson who wasn't even brandon yet he was he elantris had just come out um and mm -hmm. you know, kind of nobody knew who he was he was just teaching yeah. his class as an elective yeah um and then uh and yeah and and then, and then kind of my reading career proceeded through all of that and i started writing more and more and uh and in college uh creative writing was like the only thing I was good at. It was the only thing I enjoyed doing. Um, I, right. I was a terrible student. Uh, I just, I was super bored by everything. I hated going to class. Yeah. The only thing I got A's in was my creative writing electives. <laughs> I, I totally identify with that same feeling. Um, I, I completely understand what you're saying. I was kind of the same way. It sounds like you were probably even more voracious than I was. And I just wanted to mention um, that someone had mentioned in the chat, uh, and I'm, I'm never going to pronounce this right, but they're saying Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn? Yeah, it's, that, is, was, that was that is series. The book that you're, yeah, by that was... Tad Williams. Yeah, Tad Williams. Right. That was that was one of my first Thank you epic, for that. like like modern epic fantasies. Yeah, um, was uh, him and David Eddings were kind of my two, yeah. my lead in, um, and uh, and then I just kind of never looked back from there. Yeah, it's I I think that that's really important. Was your you mentioned there just for a moment, and the teacher in me, my ears perked up. You said that your mother read to you a lot. Is is mm -hmm. that true? That I mean, that's a wonderful thing. And for anyone watching at home, if uh, you have children, um, if if you're interested in knowing some of the best way or one of the best ways to really help your children with reading, is just simply reading to them. And it's a technique I have used. No one's going to believe me when I say this, but I have taught everything from third grade to 12th grade to college. And even when I was in 12th grade and in college, uh, I, I made a point to read to my students. Uh, and it's, yeah. it's a very, well, because I don't want to get into it too much, but the idea is that basically when children look at words on a page, uh, they see an ocean of words, and children often see it as impenetrable. And the things that say adults, when we look at it, we see a book broken up into chapters, broken up into paragraphs, broken up into sentences, broken up into like phrases and clauses. A child just sees it as an ocean of words. And by actually reading to the child and emphasizing certain words, what you're doing is setting up like an oral kind of uh, audio kind of landscape in the child's head so that they can better read. But I'm so sorry. This is not how to teach your children <laughs> to read. This is uh, Brian McClellan tonight. Um, so, so Brian, were any of those books in particular a, a real influence on you? I mean, it sounds like you lean towards the epic fantasy, but was there a particular author or a work that really, maybe it's still on your shelves today that you feel was formative for you? I mean, I, I kind of, man, like, so like very early formative would have been anything King Arthur and Robin Hood. Cool. um that was like very early formative for me i like i i remember being like like eight and my mom taking me to like an adult presentation on mm -hmm. the legends of king arthur at the local library and i sat there and i i listened and i i understood like half of it but yeah. i had read everything that the that right. the presenter was talking about and uh and you know that kind of stuff i just i really loved that kind of you know the that old English sort of, you know, mists of time, dark woods sort of mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Um, just huge amounts of fun. And I really loved it. Um, so that's like very early influence. Um, once you get kind of, 
once I got to about, you know, 12, 13, I would mm-hmm. say, and this is actually where really Promise of Blood comes from, which we were talking about briefly right before the show started. Um, Les Mis, Count of Monte Cristo, like those books, like they hit me like a ton of bricks. I loved them mm-hmm. so much. And, uh, and that kind of like jumped me up to a different level. And again, I didn't understand everything I was reading. Yeah. I didn't know the, you know, the weird tangents um, that, uh, yeah. that they like ma goes on for about sure. yeah. like the french revolution and stuff yeah. like that i didn't understand the context for any of that stuff but i loved the stories um and uh and and so those were like a giant like kind of um those those got me to want to read more stories you know like these crazy tales of you know like suffering and redemption and and mm. love and and revenge and all this stuff that's what really wanted me to read the story and then uh and then yeah and then once i got kind of older and into kind of more modern epic fantasy like mm-hmm. i remember reading i remember like for the first time really thinking about the possibility of a career and i had very recently read both brandon's first couple of books uh and joe abercrombie's uh first trilogy mm-hmm. and i i remember like making a conscious decision of i want to be right in the middle like right. content wise right like like i like so much about both of these authors neither of them quite feels like me but um you know like i want brandon's like kind of incredible world building Mm -hmm. uh but i want pacing more like joe you know i want things to move faster it's true um i don't i i like I like to read the brutality in Joe's books, but I don't really like to write it. And, but I also don't, I like it being a little more kind of a little more rated R than what Brandon writes. Um, And so like, I I made a conscious decision of, you know, somewhere right in the middle. Um, And, uh, and that's kind of where my career has gone uh, is, is something that's content wise, you know, I can recommend for advanced 12 year olds, um and with i'll give you know i'll give usually if a parent asks me i'll give them a caveat of there's a lot of violence um but uh but yeah you know you can do advanced 12 year olds all the way up to anybody you know i've yeah. sold books to people who are 90 yeah well i i mean i would say that i would place your let's just put it this way i've taught fourth fifth sixth seventh grade and i would hand one of your books to my students with no issues and um one of the things we had been talking about earlier before the program was the fact that we both seem to have very supportive parents as far as reading or maybe parents that looked the other way and just thought (laughs) oh good uh our our little brian our little matt is reading that's so good um and i and i think that you do it's funny that you mentioned those those two authors um because i i wouldn't have thought of it but i do see your books kind of in a sweet spot between the two. Um, let me ask you then. So you mentioned a, a couple of you know classic French works as being your influence. Is was it a calculated effort? That's probably the wrong way to put it. <laughs> well, I'll put it that way anyway because we don't have a lot yeah. of time. Was it a calculated effort on your part, or was it kind of like, no pun intended? Was that the spark that kind of gave you the idea for? Oh, it's going to be French Revolution era, Industrial oh. Revolution, magic in so, there. So weirdly, it wasn't. So like, it it didn't even occur to me that 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 matchup had been made until probably about six months after I wrote Promise of Blood. Um, the actual like the kind of the um, impetus for Promise of Blood was actually uh, Sharps Rifles. Um, the TV show, not the book. I, I watched oh, the TV okay. show first. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I was like, man, this really freaking cool show yeah. from the '90s, like uh, with Sean Bean um, mm-hmm. as a as a rifleman in the Napoleonic Wars. And I remember watching the first episode and immediately thinking, holy crap, I'm going to set an epic fantasy in a world exactly like that. Right. Like if, if you took, sh- you know, Sharps rifles and then put magic in the background, that's mm-hmm. essentially what I wanted to do. Um, and it just, it was an immediate spark. And, uh, and then, yeah. And then later on, I kind of like, I think somebody had asked me what my top five books were or something like that. And I was kind of listing them and I, I listed both Les Mis and kind of Monte Cristo. And then I went, wait a oh, second, yeah. that works really well. Right. 
Did you? So now, did I hear you correctly when you said that it didn't hit you until six months after you'd written the book or after you'd yeah. gotten? Yeah. So was, does that mean was... you went back and did like a page one rewrite on the whole thing? No, no, or... no. Like, no. So I had already written Promise of Blood to oh. be like it was. Okay. And and I and then I it occurred to me afterwards that these two books had been a kind of a major subconscious influence. Right. Okay. Um, which I, I hadn't even been thinking about at the time. Right. So then in, in your writing process, um, do you, because I have actually, I was kind of shocked by this. I, I talked to, um, I talked to Walter John Williams. I, I'm, I'm super lucky. I got to talk to Walter John Williams like a, a month or two ago. And I asked him, I said, well, so do you draft? And he just looked at me frankly. And he's just, just, no, I don't draft. I just, I know what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> I, I used to do that. Not anymore. Uh, and so I was wondering, and I started thinking, and I'm like, boy, I guess maybe writers put more thought into it or they flow or something. Do you draft? Do you have a process or do you sit down with a tight outline and you know exactly what you're, where you're going or how do you? Hey, I, um, I have a really complicated relationship with that entire thing. Let's hear about um, it. Let's, that's, that's what I'm here for. Please. <laughs> so, so basically, so like. So my, my, my books can almost be talked about in terms of first book in trilogies and then the other books. Um, the mm -hmm. first books, so Promise of Blood, I wrote, um, I did not even edit it. I sent it straight out to, um, to, uh, to on, on submission to editors and agents. And, uh, and so, so it was first draft, very, very, me <laughs> uh mm -hmm. and i sent it out and so i ended up getting my agent like two weeks after i sent out my first query and my agent our first business discussion was her saying look brian you're i think i was 25 i was either 24 or 25 at the time and she said look brian you're 25 you clearly have a lot of talent which is why i'm taking you on as a writer uh but also you have a long ways to go and she, uh, before she was an agent, she was a professional editor. And so she actually made me rewrite most of the book before she would even submit it. And then we ended up selling to Orbit. And uh, yeah. and then my editor there made me rewrite it uh, again. Uh, yeah. Probably probably about half of it was rewritten. Mm -hmm. um, but from that draft, the, the, the second draft that I gave my editor, almost exactly what you see in the book um very little edits very little changes to anything um and that's kind of uh and then book two and book three uh pretty much nothing just very minor edits maybe a couple of scene rewrites and now but, that would, uh, would but that yeah, be... Crimson campaign and autumn republic both essentially the first drafts is what is was published and i'm once once a world is established I'm really, really quite good at just, you know, working inside of it. Um, it's the it's the establishing the world that's yeah. difficult for me. Um, Sins of Empire, even though it was in the same universe, it's a different set of characters. It's a different set of kind of geopolitics. And uh, that one, I turned it in and my editor came back to me and said, um, so I... I'm going to let you sit on this for a while. I don't think it's great. And, uh, and then, and then she let me sit for like three months. Oh, yeah. and I finally came back to her and I said, you know, I think I rewrite the entire book from scratch. And she went, her response was, Oh, thank God. I didn't want to tell you. Oh, wow. That's I'm glad funny. you realized that on your own. So and, it sounds, and, Oh, uh, but, but since vampire is a very similar story in that, the second, the, like when I rewrote it, what I handed into her is essentially what got published. Um, because, you know, after that first draft that I kind of just mucked around in and right. wasn't very good, I was kind of able to just fix everything in my head and make the second draft work. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and the book I'm working on currently, um, oh my gosh, I have probably written 500,000 words 
for a 200,000 word book. Just and it's honestly, it's the most work I've ever put into a book. Yeah. But I'm also hoping it's the best book I ever end up with. Probably. Um, I mean, I'm going to guess the English teacher from working with my students and all of that is going to guess that, you know, with successive drafting and with successive experience, you start to be a bit harder on yourself and you also start to develop, you know, maybe a methodology or a particular approach. Because it, well, it sounds, oh, please. I, I listened to an interview with Philip Pullman uh, maybe mm -hmm. a year or two ago. And one of the things that really stuck with me was him talking about how when you become an experienced author, your difficulty suddenly flips on its head. The difficulty doesn't isn't what should I write? The difficulty is what shouldn't I write? Right? Um, because as an experienced author, you suddenly just have you know, you have infinite worlds in front of you that yeah. you can you can figure out how to make anything work right. because you're good at cajoling characters and plot lines and things like that. It's so, so whereas a brand new author is going to say, oh, I'm not actually sure what to write. You know, I, I don't know what to put on the page. Uh, you know, for me anyways, I'm like, holy crap, I don't even know where to like, I don't know what to pare back. Right. Um, there's so many different ways I can go with a single character, a single, you know, chapter um, can send your book in a thousand different directions. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, um, that's something I've been struggling with on the current book, which is why I've put so much work into it, um, is, is kind of this paralysis of options. Um, and, uh, and really, it just, you, you kind of get to that point where you, you have to force yourself to take a step back. Yeah. And look at it in a broader picture and say, okay, what can I cut? I've got all these ideas. I've put 200% more ideas into this book than I actually need. What are those ideas that I can chop away at and leave behind and maybe use later? I'll probably use them later. You know, like half the ideas that I had for uh, the first Powder Mage trilogy ended up in uh, the second Powder Mage trilogy. Mm -hmm. Um just because you know when once you get these little bugs you want to use them eventually yeah um, and uh and so so yeah i'm actually getting i'm trying to be better about drafting about uh outlining strictly i've never before this book i've never written on an outline um and uh and i'm trying to be better about it uh and uh better about kind of focusing my creative energy because i hate rewriting it's just it's the worst oh really I, okay I, I, interesting I, I absolutely loathe i i mean this is going to sound incredibly callous but i loathe doing writing that i'm not getting paid for right um and it's funny because like like i talk to a lot of authors and this is kind of this kind of makes me a little bit different from kind of the standard fantasy fan crowd i talk to a lot of authors who will say oh well you know even if i wasn't getting paid i'd still write and for me not a no. chance <laughs> like if there was something that I did better and I liked right. doing that paid more than writing for me, I would be doing that. Right. Um, and right. that's a little callous for like a creative endeavor. I think. I don't know about that, but I, don't know I, if I, I still, agree. I'm very much about kind of that, that mesh of creativity business and, and actually paying my bills um and all of that stuff i like the mix of it you know i i enjoy the business part of what i do for a living um it's you know it's kind of fun to me uh you know running a, a small business and you know shipping books out of my closet to people that want signed copies things like that well it's um, it's interesting that you say that because i in my experience of having been doing this show for the short time time i have when i do talk to authors they often inevitably they mention the business side of it and the fact that yes in the end you do need to make a living at it and it's it's not just it sounds very romantic to say well i'm going to go out there and even if i were starving on the streets and homeless and i would still be writing and it, you know when it yeah. comes down to it you people have families they need to support children that need to go to school dental bills <laughs> any number of different things that you know they they have to take care of and i i actually don't think it's cal i mean maybe this is the supportive teacher in me but i don't think it's callous <laughs> at all to say i also want to be able to make a living at this and be able to live comfortably and and have a certain standard of living and and reward myself by being able to take a break or take a vacation yeah. or 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 
um, or something else. Well, um, and it's funny because I think that a lot of creative people, they have something that they are naturally drawn to. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because when it comes to kind of the creative side, what I'm actually drawn to as a consumer is video games and comedy, um, which are two things that I don't do. Right. Um, and so, you know, as an adult, I actually don't even read that much anymore. I listen to a lot of audiobooks. I listen to a lot of like history podcasts, but like my free time goes into uh, comedy and, 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 uh, and just, and playing video games. And like, it's, it's, it's kind of weird because, you know, like most people you think, oh, if you're severely in love with video games, you would become a video game writer right. or something right. like that. But you know what? I still absolutely love writing epic fantasy you know, big yeah. thick tomes. Yeah. And, you know, and, and so, so I, so I kind of separate those two things slightly, um, you know, like my, my kind of, and so my creative kicks um, end up going towards, um, I love like base building games. Mm -hmm. I love survival games, things mm -hmm. that where I'm creating within a digital world. Mm -hmm. And, and so my kind of natural entertainment side of me uh, is, is drawn to doing that sort of stuff. And there are different uh, ways of creating. And and yeah. I think to me, again, as being a teacher, I would say that that idea of creating those private moments where you're just sort of creating on your own are no less valid than, say, something that's consumed by thousands of readers. Um, it's just not necessarily like, and, and this kind of actually believe it or not, segues a little bit into the next topic I kind of wanted to talk about was the way that the Powder Mage, the way that you sort of bring, um, you bridged Powder Mage into role playing. And I was interested in, in maybe hearing a little bit about your role playing experience and, and your background and, and perhaps if any role playing experiences had perhaps colored the way that you write now or perhaps the way you consume now or even like you were mentioning before i do i've been following your twitter too and i know you're a big video game game fan but um can you speak a little bit about how how powder mage ended up as an rpg because i think it's an awesome idea i think it's fantastic um, yeah so that one is actually kind of i i can't really take credit for that so there's a, a really talented uh um rpg developer named alan barr um, and he, uh, Alan's awesome. He's very good. He, he owns, uh, it's Gallant Knight Games, um, mm -hmm. is his, yep. his production company. Um, and he came to me, gosh, this would have been like six years ago or something like that. I think we had dinner at, uh, at Gen Con one year, uh, with a mutual friend. And he said to me, Hey, you know, I, I loved Promise of Blood. Would you be interested in me doing a conversion? For powder mage and we talked about it on and off for a couple of years and then we ended up just doing it and uh and essentially what it ended up with um with i wrote the content i commissioned art all of that stuff and uh and alan handled all the rules um because funny enough at that point i had not played an rpg for probably 10 years um i played with my high school friends a bunch i played very briefly a little bit in college um and then kind of as a 20 year old in my in my 20s i just i never touched rpgs again mm -hmm. and then it was alan kind of saying oh do you want to do that kind of got me thinking about rpgs again mm -hmm. uh and uh, and i ended up in a gaming group with alan and dan wells um where we uh i was invited to start playing uh pendragon with them and, and oh, it's funny because cool. pendragon is like um i don't I, I mean i don't really know the rpg world super well but from what i understand pendragon is like kind of an ancient sort of esoteric sort of game but i loved it and it was yeah. really fun to play with them. and uh and then i started playing rpgs more and then um and then dan and i uh eventually ended up starting um like a twitch channel and we uh so we do oh. every tuesday night we play uh we we've got we developed a, a uh, two years ago, we started doing this. We developed a, uh, our own world to play D and D five E in, and uh, and we just finished that one up. And we've got a new campaign that started three weeks ago, I think, two or three weeks ago. Um, and uh, and so yeah, so we play live every Tuesday night um, with a bunch of our author friends, um, and that's a and that's a blast because it's it's like more RPGing than I've done the rest of my life. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But so going back to the Powder Mage RPG, uh, so so we um, we kind of came to this arrangement, and uh, and Alan you know gave me the contacts. He helped me with the Kickstarter, and he uh, he did all the rules conversions for Savage Worlds, um, and then I just wrote the content and. Um, and we kind of just developed this book and it ended up being quite a lot of fun. Um, the RPG writing was way harder than any writing I had done for a long time. Um, so I, like, I'm so used to thinking about in terms of narrative, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they, they talk about one of the things that, uh, like a creative writing teacher will try to beat into their students is, um, is the idea of world builders disease where you're, you spend so much time building the world that you don't actually flesh out the narrative. I have almost the opposite problem where I spend so much time developing a narrative that my world can get kind of fuzzy on the edges. And so when you're writing the RPG content, you're just writing world. Right. And, and I had not done that since I was like 14 and was first playing around with writing things down. Uh, and so that was genuinely very difficult. Um, and uh, it turned out to be a lot of fun. And I think it was actually a really good learning experience for kind of creating uh, a little bit more depth to the, the edges of, of my existing worlds. Um, yeah. And it was fun with Powder Mage because, you know, as I've learned from doing all the short fiction, you know, epic fantasy fans, they love to get extra content. Um, oh, and, yeah. and so a, a lot of the times I'll sell the powder mage RPG to people, um, because they just want to learn more about the powder. That's mage exactly right. And, <laughs> and they'll say, totally they'll say, agree. look, I don't play RPGs, but I want a signed copy because, you know, I'm going to read all the, all, about all the other, the nations and all the other people yes. that, you know, populate this cool world that you made. That's um, exactly what I was kind of going to get at and and that's what i think is so cool about the game is that sometimes when you when you you know if i pick up the teenage mutant ninja turtles role-playing game it's not actually written well it's not actually written by eastman and laird so to yeah. me it doesn't feel like canon um if i pick up a star wars d6 game even though it's endorsed by lucasfilm it's still not created by george so it's not canon right. but if i pick up the powder mage rpg I know that you were the writer, so I can say, aha, see, page 15 says that this happened. You're wrong or whatever. So in that respect, <laughs> did you did you discover anything about your own world as you were creating the, as you were writing the content for the RPG, or was it kind of the way you expected it to come out? Um, I think it was kind of the way I had expected it to come out. Um, you, know, you know, people talk about discovery writing like it's magic. Um, you know, for me, it's more like, it's almost more like an equation. You're figuring, you're, you're solving problems to create a world or a narrative or a background or whatever. And for me, uh, the RPG was a lot of problem solving in terms mm -hmm. of what was and was not canon because I wanted, oh. you know, I'd already written a bunch of these short fiction, uh, a bunch of the short fiction. I had already written, I think at that point, five of the powder made of the six novels. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really wanted to, um, I, I wanted to make sure that everything was going to be canon and that it all fit together. Yeah. And when you're looking at, you know, a million words of content, you yeah. know, that may not mean much to somebody like Steven Erickson, um, but a million words of content to make sure that I didn't get things wrong. Right. Um, you know, uh, that's, that's rough. And that was part of the difficulty in writing the RPG was, right. was doing that kind of fact checking. Um, you know, because when you, when you have a star Wars RPG, you know, they probably have a dozen interns. I that can imagine everything to make right. sure right. there's no overlapping content. You know, yeah. they employ people who literally have everything memorized um you know so they know everything but you know with powder mage it's me <laughs> you right. know like like it's done well but it's not done you know sell millions of copies well so it's just me uh and that's that can be really difficult uh in keeping just trying to keep things straight uh and knowing what things you know like i so we recently uh you know we announced this a couple months ago uh that we um that we optioned the powder mage series for tv i was and, gonna say uh, 
congratulations and and thank you and and the showrunner is is really awesome um and he's been in constant contact with me and we've talked a ton about the stuff and it's the funny thing is that when he first got in touch and he said hey i'm gonna be your showrunner um like i would love to kind of use you as a resource like i realized i did not remember what the crap happened in promise of Blood. right i mean i had written um you know like i had written six books since and uh six full-sized epic fantasy novels plus a bunch of short fiction plus my urban fantasy plus an rpg so i did not remember what had happened in promise of blood and i'm like give me a minute right i'm gonna need to re reread some things that's funny um, that's that's interesting so that means i guess as you're going you're you're like a maybe like a true writer you once a book is finished it's kind of in the rearview mirror and you're focused yeah. on whatever you're working on at that that moment very much um you know promise of blood honestly until i started my reread uh, about two months ago i oh don't think i had read it since 2013 when it came out um so yeah eight years with tons of other stuff in between in between yeah. um and i don't have a great memory of the best of days <laughs> uh so uh so it was it was kind of weird like looking back at like my younger author self and and seeing what decisions i made and yeah. seeing you know like you know sometimes i'll read something and i'll be like what was i thinking with that line or that character other times i'll read it and go oh man i'm pretty good at this <laughs> that's great that's really good uh, and, i mean yeah i think that's fantastic so it's kind of all, yeah you know, it's all over the place, but it's still, it's kind of fun. It's like almost like a, a little mini time capsule for my brain. Um, and, uh, and, and the, but, but yeah, so, so it's, uh, the, the creative aspect of it is just, it, it, it can, it, to me, I, I think I sometimes get a little too much into the, um, the equation side of things. Oh, what makes a good narrative? Uh, is this scene a little too long? Uh, is this character, uh, you know, too wishy-washy? You know, I get a little too into that. Um, it's funny because I sent the first draft of my latest book to my editor um, and, uh, and she came back to me and she said, uh, her big criticism was, um, was, was that I needed to let the characters breathe because mm -hmm. I was spending so much time relentlessly right. driving them Moving towards the, the end of the book yeah that um uh, that i had kind of lost touch with their personalities a little bit and uh, and so the last kind of month of my my rewrite has been going back through and making sure that i really know the characters right rather than just knowing the story um, it's it's and, interesting though to me again i i'm so sorry to keep mentioning how i'm an english teacher but what i notice sometimes in in students is that when i'm and i think that this phenomena is true of all human beings not necessarily of but the learning process sometimes when we are learning something we'll write in a, or we'll work in a certain direction and then we reflect on that and we realize huh i probably needed to go a little bit in that other direction so then we overcompensate sometimes and then yeah. at the end of the next branch like with the next work that we produce we look back and we find the middle ground and then we add in additional things so what it sounds like to me is as an author you seem to be and this is true i think of an author no matter what age or how many books they've i, I think of a good author it's a good sign it sounds to me like you're reflecting on what you've created and then course correcting and making the necessary adjustments in order to to improve your improve your work um and and to me maybe other english teachers out there know what i'm talking about this is super interesting to hear from <laughs> from from a uh, from a famous published author but it it well it, it's funny that you talk about course correction because um because I, you know, the, one of the criticisms I got when I, for, of Promise of Blood was that there wasn't enough female characters in it. And I, I remember reading that and kind of going like, you know, because at the time I, I, my, like, at the time my thought was, well, I'm not a woman. I should not write female point of views. Like mm -hmm. I, I will do bad at it. I'm very young. I'm very inexperienced. And that kind of came back to bite me in the butt, you know, mm -hmm. once I, you know, once I started getting reviews for Promise of Blood. Um, Crimson Campaign was already written at that time, so I really mm -hmm. couldn't do anything with Crimson Campaign. 
But then I wrote Autumn Republic with that in mind. Yeah. And it's very funny because I, my, I, I handed it in and I can't remember, if, I think it was my agent who told me this, who read it. And she came back to me and said, hey, I know about this criticism, but literally every single character in this book is a woman. Right. And you need to not do that because right. you overcorrected. And so I, I paired that back and I tried to, I tried to be a little bit, I tried to take a step back and look at the bigger picture and try to, right. you know, like make it a little bit more equal. But like, that was a major course correction I did. It didn't reach the final, you know, uh, draft. draft. Um, but I ended up literally just going through and switching a few genders and, you know, right. You know, and it was all side characters, you know, the main characters were already established and there. Um, but, uh, but it was a very, like, it was a funny, like, realization of being like, oh, man, I internalized that particular criticism so strongly that I just did a total 180 on the next book. Um, and I'm sure that there's a bunch of other things that I haven't even realized that I've done. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of thankfully at the point in my career where I don't actually care about reviews anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, uh, but that first trilogy, especially, I read every single review and I right. just, I, I thought about them all, all the time. And I, I think I actually became pretty good at separating the kind of, you know, the people that won't be happy with anything yeah. um, or the people that that uh that they just don't they're not into this sort of thing right versus the people that actually had constructive criticism right and um because i actually like constructive criticism it makes me a better writer yeah uh, makes me a better person um but but there's you know especially you know as we know in the days of twitter and facebook anybody can you know call you anything online yes um and yes. so being able to sort through those things and figure out which is which, which is useful to you right. as a person. Um, that kind of became a very important skill, which, as I said, I don't actually use anymore because I don't read reviews. Um, but I still have beta readers and I still have friends who read my books and come back and say, oh, this thing, you know, you could have done a little differently, you know, stuff like that. So I yeah. still do get plenty of criticism. Yeah. Um, it's just I try to avoid the criticism from rando people. Yeah, I think I think that's a smart way of looking i think that's important too because i think ultimately i mean ultimately you're you know i i don't know about you but when i create something whether it be just an interview or whether i'm playing a, a role-playing game or whatever i'm usually trying to please myself in a way that i think is is fair and honest and if i'm doing that then there will be an audience whether it be five people that are playing my rpg that evening or or maybe 50 people that are watching an interview or whatever it is and I, I think that's a really good um sort of way to be and and actually speaking of that how how then you had mentioned and this interests me enormously i i asked this of walter john williams as well you said that you were playing rpgs with writer other writers what is that like are you guys are, are <laughs> you trying to like outdo each other in a writerly fashion or are you trying to I mean, or are you trying to like one up each other with your creativity? And and do you consider yourself to be more of a player or or maybe a game master in that way? Um, you know, it's funny because I I I tend to be very careful with the friends that I choose to actually spend time with. <laughs> um, and I really like chill people. Um, and so I tend the writers that I play with tend to be very chill. You know, right. nobody's one upping. Um. I, I think that it's more, I mean, I'm sure some of that happens subconsciously, you know, that's just going to happen. Um, but, but I think it's, it's, it's going to be when I play with other writers, especially, you know, for like, for typecast RPG, my, my show that I do with Dan, um, when I play with other writers, it, I, I view it more as performing and almost improv yeah. than I do as writing. Yeah. Um, because, you know, uh, because I do not do collaborative writing. It's just not a thing that I like, you know, I like being in 1000% control of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and why I, I would likely be a terrible, uh, uh, intellectual property writer, you know, like for star Wars and, you know, right. world of Warcraft and stuff like that. I'd be yeah. really bad at it because I like being in control. Um, but with an RPG, especially, you know, telling a story to an audience, it's, it's more like improv in that you're trying to build upon each other rather than outdo each other. 
Um, and I, I prefer that for, for an RPG. Um, I want us all to be kind of, I want us all to be having fun yeah. for, for, uh, first, uh, and I want us all to be just, you know, engaged and interested. And I, I want us all to want to be there the next week. Yeah. Um, and when you start doing one upmanship and things like that, you know, I check out of that sort of thing very, very quickly. Um, I, I am, uh, I guess I'm I'm a competitive person, but I don't like competition. It's it kind of just it stresses me out. And so the moment you know somebody wants to make it a competition, I just I my brain just kind of checks out, and I'm not yeah. enjoying myself anymore. I, I um, think that's I, I think that's a really important thing. I mean, because honestly, when it comes down to it, you're you're right. If you're streaming, it becomes a little bit more about a performative sort of thing. But the game yeah. in general, I believe, works best because it's a collaborative effort between four or five, six different imaginations who are all kind of throwing something into the pot. And then at the end of the mm -hmm. night, you kind of taste it and see what you have. And, and um, I, think that's, I, I think that's a really healthy attitude. Um, are you, are you, do you consider yourself to be player or GM then? Like, uh, at very heart. much player. Hmm. Um, very much player. Uh, when I'm when I'm playing, I, I want to be playing, uh, you know, because GM is very much to me. GM is a it's it's a you're you're, her, you're the herdsman, you know. You're mm -hmm. trying to get people to do things and carry forward a narrative and stuff like that. And I do not want to be that person, you know. That's kind. Of, I mean, that's my day job is is writing books and create and and pushing forward a narrative. Um, you know, I will do that as a player, as you know, as a character. Yeah. Um, but I don't want to be the, the God looking down, right. trying to, you know, get these, you know, these dumb sheep with axes trying to go into that <laughs> stupid cave over there. You know, like I, I just, that whole thing. Um, I remember, uh, I, I DM'd for my high school group of friends for like three weeks and I kind of hated it and I wasn't good oh. at it. Um, oh. I would just, I would just much rather be, I, I'd much rather be in the story than trying to tell it. Yeah. Um, and you know, and it's funny because as I say these things, I realize well, the characters are telling the story, but like, but the, but the DM is trying to, you know, put the, is trying to build a fence around whatever's going on. Yes. And 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 herd the players, and that's just that feels too much like writing to me. It's, and um... then it's no longer fun. I, I think it's it's interesting that you say that because I th I, I felt it um, obviously I, I I'm not a published author but as a p long term GM and player I, I was kind of like you I was uh, in high school I was maybe by default I was the GM probably because I was always coming up with weird ideas and whatnot and they people like them um, but there is this tremendous sense of there's the, almost this in, uh, beautiful not to get too romantic, there's this really wonderful uh, focus that you have when you have one character and you focus on how to play that character and you think about, you know, things that other people are saying, other characters are saying, and what the game master is sort of presenting for you or the dungeon master. And um, to me, I, I've always enjoyed kind of like um, that aspect of, of playing. And it's really nice to hear you describe that because so many people I know... Um, will say that they they love being a game master and and it's kind of something that you hear a lot you hear a lot of people saying that they it's it's always hard to find them but when i talk to people that i interview they often say that they enjoy being the gm but talking mm -hmm. to someone that enjoys playing that character is is to be honest it's a little bit of a relief to to hear <laughs> that actually is there a character if you wouldn't mind sharing is there a character or or maybe that stands out in your mind that you've played at some point in the past that you particularly like or um, stays with you or uh, was enjoyable for you i mean like in gosh i i don't even remember the characters i played in high school you know like that was so long ago um that you know they're like i i have very vivid memories of of certain like things that happened um in the campaigns or you know like you know how those those like kind of snippets stay with you yes. no matter how old you get yes. um you know, like just funny, dumb little stories and, mm -hmm. and, you know, laughing for hours with my friends about the stupid things we'd, um, 
and uh so i've got like that but characters themselves like um like i'd have to just go recently you know playing um playing uh this uh twitch show with dan um so the character i played for two years every week um was named krustov and he was a tiefling um a tiefling cleric necromancer build um and i decided to go with i don't know if you've seen umbrella academy yeah um but uh ah, gosh what's the name of the guy that talks to the dead i always forget his name oh is it klaus no i don't know maybe someone will tell us in the chat i've forgotten so i had when we started the campaign that first season had just come out Mm -hmm. and i decided to base a character off of him you know somebody who is incredibly damaged yeah um and and like so when you know when talking about alignment i would call him chaotic flea um (laughs) and uh and he was just an absolute blast to play because he was in he was the smartest person in the group but he was so messed up right. from like his whole background his childhood all this trauma that had happened to him that he was uh, that i played him kind of unpredictable mm-hmm. um and it was really fun to play and i don't know if my fellow players would have enjoyed <laughs> him terribly with the um, same but yeah. i had a blast with him um because i could kind of dig into you know, somebody who's deeply conflicted about everything, but trying to pretend they're not. Right. And, you know, stuff like that. And it's just, you know, digging into a single character for me is so much more fun than trying to plan an encounter. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, so, so again, yeah, player, definitely player for me. It is, um, and, and did you ever think to yourself, man, maybe I should write a story about this? uh did any of your adventures inspire you at all or nope, not at not all even, not even slightly wow yeah. what why do you think that is i talk to so many people and they tell me all the time they're like i had I, and granted these are not published authors but that's why i'm interested in your perspective i talk to a lot of role players that will say oh my goodness my my character i just want to write a story about this character what is it that that makes that character fall through your filter? Um, maybe that's different than your your not your novel ideas or short story ideas. You know, there's probably a couple of reasons. Um, I would say the biggest reason is something I've already talked about a bit <clears throat> is that the difference between my work brain and my play brain, mm-hmm. um, you know, creativity, creati- creatively. Uh, is very I like I try to keep those strictly apart when I am playing a game I do not want to be thinking about right you know oh well I should write a character like this um you know like I I I want to be playing the game to play it I'm I'm there to have fun with my friends and and if and if that character gives me subconscious inspiration for other things that go on in my work life that totally happens I can't think of an example, but I definitely, mm-hmm. I, it's just, you know, it's that subconscious filter of, oh, that was a creative thing. Yeah. I'll use it in a story someday. Yeah. Um, but I never look at a particular character or a particular RPG narrative and say, oh, that was so cool. I want to write it. Um, yeah. It's just not how my brain works at all. Cool. And I, I don't know. I, I think, um, yeah, I think, I think it's really just a matter of, of of me wanting to play that character in the moment to have fun yeah um you know it's uh like like when i when i talked uh so a couple of years ago i had all of my high school friends came to visit me um well not all of them as many as i could get to come and we but we had like eight guys in my basement uh for a weekend and it was a blast you know because we hadn't all gotten together for 12 or 13 years um and so, and we played a and d game and one of my friends had been getting into streaming and he, you know, popped up and said, hey, why don't we stream this D&D game? And like, and I, I, I feel maybe I treated him a little unfairly on this, but I, I was, I just shut that down immediately yeah. because the idea of hanging out with my high school buddies who have known me for 20 years or more yeah. versus like but but hanging out with them but also in a public forum where like you know writer brian is normally like 
like that stressed me out so bad that I immediately just said, no, I will absolutely not do that. Um, if you want to stream it, fine, I will not participate. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's just, uh, you know, I, I want to keep that kind of line between, you know, the public persona of author Brian McClellan versus, you know, the person who likes to swear a lot with their friends. Right. Um, it's so, you know, like, I, I, totally get what you're saying and it's funny because um i so i told you a little bit about what i've been doing for the last six or nine months so i started my mm -hmm. stream uh or my channel just uh, just recently and what's funny is i thought to myself who are the guys that i want to help me out with this and i thought oh my friends from high school who i've been playing with forever and mm -hmm. um they it's worked out really well but he, the funny thing is this, um, I had to sort of draw a line and I said to them, look guys, I'm, I'm kind of doing this. It is a hobby, it's just for fun. I'm never gonna make a million dollars off of it, but I, it is, there is sort of a, there's a performative aspect to it. Um, can we yeah. all agree to this? And they all agreed to it and they've been really wonderful about it. And the funny thing that you mentioned that it seems like maybe we're similar in this respect, um, I have noticed, so I just completed my first season one campaign with my buddies, and uh, after about 20 episodes, I sort of sat down and I said, guys, I really enjoyed that, but you know what I miss? I miss just when we get together and we, we tell jokes. Like, we, we play now for three hours. It's a very concentrated stream, and it used to be about four to four and a half hours because of so much laughter and goofing off and silly, mm -hmm. you know, tangents. And um, I'm actually, what's funny is I'm looking at maybe for the next one, I think what I want to do is like scale it back a little bit and then give ourselves like maybe have a couple streaming, you know, weeks. And then we have a couple weeks where we play a separate game where it's, it's our real game yeah. where we're just sort of goofing around and having fun with it. Yeah. So it's really yeah, interesting. It, it, and when you have any sort of public thing, like you as a teacher, you've got students You've got, I, I assume, hundreds of former students, yeah. uh, maybe thousands. You know, you have people who know who you are in public, and and so there's there's that kind of line that you have to draw between your private self and your public self, and right. whether you're a teacher or an author or whoever, you you have to figure out where that line is, yeah. and then and then stick to it. And and I've I've had. I wouldn't say conflicts, but I, I've had, you know, brief words with friends and even family members who have blurred that line and yeah. it really makes me uncomfortable. And, right. uh, and it's, uh, and, and you just kind of have to, you have to kind of set it down. You have to be chill about it, but also firm, you know, like, yeah, this is no, <laughs> like, that's not something I'm comfortable with. Um, those are two different people almost, you know? Right. Right. Well, Brian, we're we're almost we're actually we are out of time, but I, I just kind of wanted to ask you maybe one final question. Is there anything exciting? I, I know you have your your couple uh, books that you have out now. Do, would you like to tell us or share with us or give us any information um, about any cool projects you have coming up or maybe one you have out now that you're really excited about? Is there anything? So um, I actually have uh, the it's the book that I'm I'm finishing right now that uh, mm -hmm. it's due in a little over two weeks and I have a crap load of work to do on it. Um, oh, but uh, so as of right now, as long as I don't fall behind on deadlines, it um, uh, I've got a new epic fantasy coming out from Tor uh, in I think they've scheduled me for spring 2022. Okay, um, so uh, about a year, 13 months um and uh so uh that is the first book is going to be called uh in the shadow of lightning uh it's the book one of the glass immortal series um and it is big fat fantasy uh it'll feel very similar to powder mage um cool. uh, it's flintlock sort of 1800s um a couple of new magic systems uh and uh big kind of geopolitical world uh that i've just had a huge amount of fun creating and playing with um, and, uh, yeah, so that'll be the launch of my big new epic fantasy. So that's going to, is this going to be in a separate world than the Powder Mage world? Yeah, this is oh, a cool. whole new world. Cool. Uh, whole new universe. Uh, and, uh, yeah. And I, uh, as long as I have time, I keep saying this, I've said this for like two years and I still don't get back to them, but as long as I have time, 
Um, I also have uh, a more Powder Mage novellas yes. kind of in the back of my brain. Uh, and then oh. uh, another Valkyrie Collections. Uh, I, I, I was supposed to get to it over the winter, and then I fell behind on this current epic fantasy. So hopefully I'll turn this book in, and then I'll get a few months to work on. I'll get a new Powder Mage novella and a new urban fantasy out, self-published, so hopefully this summer. That's, cool. um, that's fingers crossed. I'm not promising in concrete here, but uh, right. <laughs> yeah, fingers okay. crossed. Well, we'll we'll be sure to. I will definitely be sure to look for them, and I and I do recommend them as an English teacher to any students or viewers out there. I highly recommend them. And once again, I just want to say I'm not paid for these interviews. <laughs> I choose these from what you see on the shelves here in the background. So uh, everybody that I interview is is someone that I whose work I really believe in. Um, so Brian, I, I just want to say thank you so much for for spending your your precious time here. I know you have your book to get your new book to get back to. Um, I very much appreciate it, and uh, I definitely wish you the best with your future endeavors. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank today. you very much. All right, everybody, have a good night out there. <laughs>